previous year's or previous semester's finals as opposed to the long previous semester's practice. Um, practice finals a little open-ended. It's intentional, make you just think about the problems and what you're doing. We're going to cover, we're going to go through some of the final today. We'll cover the rest of the final on Tuesday. Um, practice final. And then on Thursday, depending on if you have guys have more questions about what's going to be on the final, I'll answer those. Or we're going to do a demonstration on how to use some of these things, how to, how to do uh, like complete projects from end to end um, <coughs> using, using some existing systems. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about that on th uh, Tuesday next week and Thursday next week, and based on what you guys want to do. Um, so we're going to go through these. We won't go through every question. We're going to skip around so that you guys have a chance to do this on your own as well. But uh, in general, the, one of the things is the final is cumulative in the sense that I expect you to know all the information from the entire uh, class, from the entire uh, material, from the entire semester. Thank you. Um, but um, we're going to go over, all, hopefully we'll be able to cover most of it today in the review um, with the rest of it that you don't, that we don't cover up the same before Tuesday. Um, so let's do this one. Number one, when discussing variables and values, we often talk about, how, about using the correct type. Why do we use data types? Which of those is the best answer about why we use data types? <coughs> So which one of these answers would you say is the best? C. C. D. <coughs> so, so there's only one answer here. Uh, well, there's a single best answer, not there's only one answer. Um, let's look at A first of all. Does A make any sense? A doesn't make any sense. We don't, we don't want to make sure that only certain kinds of data get stored. We want to be able to store any kind of data that we want. That's one of the goals. Um, B, types allow the compiler to ensure only valid assignments are made before execution. Um, this is somewhat true for compilers, compiled languages, but languages like Python and Lua or Bash don't do that. You can try to execute anything you like. In those languages, and if it'll absolutely try to do that, it won't. It won't. It won't test it beforehand. It'll just fail. Um, in C, so types tell the compiler and the CPU how to interpret the ones and zeros in memory. That's true, right? Like we talk about, strings have ASCII characters, and ASCII characters tell the the, the individual bytes how to be represented on the strings in terms of letters and numbers and so on and so forth. Like all of this is rendered using ASCII characters. Well, this is actually technically an image because it's a PDF, but this is a JPEG. If you didn't know, PN, uh, PDFs are technically JPEGs with text on top of them, which is weird. Um, versus D, data representation. Because all information must be stored in ones and zeros, types provide a method for interpreting those ones and zeros, and a standard method for manipulating them, such as such that they consistently match our conceptualization of that type. Is there a difference between C and D? If there isn't really a difference, which of them is more complete? D is more complete. D contains what C says and more information. So in this case, D would be the correct answer. Number two. Object-oriented programming is. <coughs> Let's read those. Any of these just wrong? What do you say? You say A is wrong. So why do you say A is wrong? Ah, okay. So the, the the word the data points were okay. All right, cool. I had that complaint last semester too. <laughs> 
All right, so let's assume that instead of, say, data points, uh, let's say into uh, higher order concepts into data instead of data points. Does that, would that be okay then? All right, let's, let's take the word points off of that, that, that answer. Would, then is A wrong then? Not necessarily, right? So this is the problem. Is which of these is the most correct? Um, so <clears throat> object-oriented programming is a technique that's designed to allow programmers to work together on large projects, right? That's true. Um, how? How are they? How do, how does object-oriented programming allow large or bigger groups work together on large projects? Inheritance, polymorphism, so the, the things that object-oriented programming gives us. Um, what about the bundling of different forms of data together to single, a single, easily accessible structure? That's also true, right? But there's both. There's a problem with B, maybe more so than the problem with D. Um, the problem with B is that it doesn't require, this, the way that B is worded, it doesn't require that an object is holistic or conceptually sound. For example, we could make a class called apples and bananas that contain all of the things that are both apples and bananas. That would work in object-oriented programming. There's no reason why we can't do that. Or we could have a, a class that would be cars and bananas, which would encapsulate everything that would be a car and everything that would be a banana, even though those are separate conceptual concepts. And that would still fall under the definition of B. And so B isn't specific enough in the sense that B doesn't separate the, con the idea that things need to be separated out in concepts. Part of the reason why D is true is because we, allow, we separate them into con coherent conceptual <coughs> concepts. If we were working on a project together, and I make a class called Cars and Bananas, and you have to use that single class when you're talking about cars and when you're talking about bananas, when you're writing software that deals with, that, that, that would be run in a supermarket, well, my Cars and Bananas class has to be called every time we ring up a couple of bananas at the, at the checker at the front. Does that make a lot of sense? That actually make it, might make it more confusing. And so that's where D and B are lacking in the sense that they're the, one of the core tenets of object-oriented programming, or what I think object-oriented programming, the core tenet is, is it is A and C. Um, is there a difference between A and C? <coughs> or which one of those is more complete? A has more words. <laughs> That's good. Um, actually, what I ended up doing is I ended up giving credit for both A and C on this because they're, they're pretty much indistinguishable. Um, a is a little bit more complete with the exception of the word for points. And that's where a bunch of people were like, I don't know what that means. I don't like that. That was okay. Number three, why do we have a variety of programming languages? Again, this is one of those ones where all of these answers might be correct. I think D is probably the best answer. Which one? B. B is a boy. <clears throat> bad. Bad. Um, okay. Um, let's skip a couple of these. Uh, going back to three, you, you wouldn't accept uh, answer B. No. Answer what now? Uh, D or D is a dog? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the contention that I have with D is I don't think D will ever be true. We may approximate um, a single solution, but one of the things that we have is when we talk about some programming concepts, for example, we talk about um, functional programming <laughs> versus object oriented programming. Object oriented programming and functional programming um, have in irreconcil irreconcilable conflicts. For example, functional programming does not have state that you can modify. 
during the, ex the execution of a function. Whereas object-oriented programming is about modifying the state of objects during the execution of a function. Those are the, those, so those, those two things are irreconcilable, so D probably can't ever be true. That's the reason why I wouldn't accept D. Good question. Um, oh, let's get these. Uh, number five. In which step does the value of a variable get resolved? What does this mean? <coughs> let's draw a little bit first. There's only one correct answer. <coughs> So what are the steps, what are the big block steps that we have in the execution or the, uh, the, the running of a program? Take input. Okay. So we have the take input and the input, which we'll put over here. We'll have the tokenizer is the first big step. Tokenizer. After the tokenizer, CFG. we have the parser. <laughs> Or the CFG. Those are the two. Those are that, those parts. After we have the parser or the CFG, what do we have? Emulator. We have either the code emitter or the, the evaluator. Um, we looked at the evaluator in Python, and when we were doing it, we found out that we couldn't do the assignment with the evaluator. Um, that's just a limitation of the eval code or the eval function in Python. Um, but these are the basic concepts that we do. What does the tokenizer do? It splits the string or the, all of those characters into this, the conceptual chunks or this, the potential conceptual chunks. So for example, if I say x equals 3, and the next line I say print x plus 2, I'm going to print out 5. The question is, when does the value of the variable x in the second line here, as an example, when does the value of x get determined? So does the tokenizer know about the value of x? The answer is no, because all the tokenizer does is split it up. Does the parser or the context-free grammar know about the value of x? It does not, because all the parser and the context-free grammar do is determine that the sentence is that some uh, grammatically valid. After we do the, the parser and the context-free grammar, we either have the evaluator or the code emitter. What is the difference between an evaluator and a code emitter? So what does the code emitter do? <coughs> so it does not execute the code. It emits machine code. Produces Does the machine code, does the, is the machine code run yet? No. It's not run until you execute that program. So for example, when you write a C program that has an assignment and then a print, for example, a, a printf, it generates some machine code that will execute that code when you run that program. However, the evaluator really does execute the instruction. In an example, for example, for in a, in a compiled language like C, when we look at this print line here without any optimizations, so if you go, but what about optimization? In this case, several points. Without any optimizations in a compiled language like C, 
at this point, we produce some bytecode, some machine code, that is able to print the value of x plus 2. And it probably actually doesn't print the value of x plus 2. It probably adds 2 to the value of x and then prints that value in that order. Do we know the value of x yet in the machine code without optimization? So the answer is no. All we know is the instructions to evaluate that code. For example, if you were thinking about this in terms of um, in terms of uh, 68,000, uh, 68, Motorola 68,000 code, we could do something along these lines. Um, move 3 into D1. That would move the value of 3 into D1. Then we could add um, 2 to D1. And then we could dump D1. If you don't know the dump command, I'm sorry that I never taught you that. It's a cheap way, cheap way to uh, print the single register from the screen. So, you know. <laughs> wow. There's a dump command and print it, it automatically does the strip and all the CVP stuff. Wow. wow. A year later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the documentation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's what up. At this point, if we're just looking at the binary, we're just looking at the binary in these places here, do we know the value of D1? And the answer is no. All we know is the register that is used that will have the value for D1. We don't know the actual value of D1. Once the command, once the one, ones and zeros are executed by the CPU, then the value of D1 will become apparent and we'll be able to print it. So the code emitter doesn't know the value of D1 yet. So when we talk about the code emitter, in this case up here, the code emitter doesn't know the value of x. All it does is it produces a sequence of ones and zeros that will produce the, cor the correct output when executed. Now there are some compilers that we call optimizing compilers. Uh, GCC is an example of an optimizing compiler. If you do GCC and you do a dash O or a dash O2, the GCC will actually look at this and go, oh, okay, that is the value of x equals 3, that's a, st that's a static value. Not static in the way, not static in the way it's a uh, permanent value, the fixed value of 3 doesn't change. We can take 3 plus 2, I can calculate that to 5. I know how to re roll up the, the, the print. And it would actually reduce all of this into a single thing that would look something like this. Dump the value of 5 to the screen. It would eliminate all the rest of the code. That's called an optimizing compiler. Um, this is the reason why I said Without an optimizing compiler, it doesn't know the value. With an optimizing compiler, the compiler will, because the optimizing compiler is actually half a value or half compiler, half code limit. So that's a separate step. And optimizing compilers are an entirely different ballgame. Um, compilers today are better than humans are at compiling things and producing uh, assembly language code. This wasn't always true, but it was definitely true. Uh, which brings us to the evaluator. The evaluator is the only one that actually knows the value of x because the evaluator is the only part of the chain that actually executes the code as written. The rest of it all produce, the rest of the other, the other parts of it are only there to produce code that can execute to produce the correct output, not determining what the actual output is. Does it make the, the, the difference between the two of those make sense? Compiled code versus uh, interpreted code. Compilers versus interpreters. Compilers in general produce faster code in the sense that you have less overhead. Do all object-oriented programming methodologies provide the same mechanisms? It's, 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 
So the reason why D, I don't, I, I don't value D as a correct answer is while the statement is true, it doesn't answer the question as to whether or not all object-oriented programming methodologies provide the same mechanism. The answer might be no, but it doesn't provide any backup for it. It's just, that's, it's kind of like saying, um, are all bananas sweet? No. Some apples have cores. Yes. Great. Tell me anything about bananas. So, A and B are the two uh, possibilities here. So let's think about, for example, Python versus Java. Does Python provide the same mechanisms that Java does, or does Python lack a mechanism that Java has, or does Java lack a mechanism that Python does? Right. What, what, yeah. This Python doesn't have access specifiers. Right. So Python doesn't have access specifiers. Everything's public. What does Python have that Java doesn't? Or what does Python support that is difficult in, in Java? Multiple inheritance? That is true as well. C++ also supports multiple inheritance that Java does not. Um, there's another thing that we did in class, which was aggregation, where we had the same function operate on multiple classes without defining it twice. And Python allows that, Java does not. These are not inherited classes, these are completely separate classes. Those are both examples of object-oriented paradigms. Java doesn't support aggregation very well. Python doesn't support um, uh, public practice. So the answer would be no, some languages provide more mechanisms than others. And sometimes it's not even more, sometimes it's just different mechanisms. Um, what is the concept that allows functional languages to execute in parallel? <coughs> C. What is independency? So. Uh, uh, independency is that means that one function call or one execution doesn't affect the other execution. How do we achieve independency? That's part of it. We have to have some sort of vector of data to execute upon. But what is the, what's the, the it's, half of the answer is in the question there. <laughs> no. B. So, so the no variables and the no and the no side effects are the parts that allow us to get there. Um, list comprehensions are how we achieve parallelism in, in functional languages, but it's not um, uh, uh, what allows us to. Without independency, you don't have list. You don't have parallel list comprehensions. Like Python doesn't actually have independency, therefore it doesn't have parallel list comprehensions. Um, but it's the no side effects and the lack of variables or the lack of mutable variables, I should say, because. Technically, they have math variables, but they don't have mutable variables. So those are the, that's what the independency is. Uh, we'll do a little bit of list comprehensions. Um, let's do some Python ones, because Pascal makes me upset in the brain. Um, what was the answer number five? Uh, let's practice a couple. So. If you don't remember, a list comprehension in Lua, or not Lua, sorry, in Python consists of the function to execute. For some variable. In some data source. With the optional if if some condition. Go ahead and write 
a list comprehension that produces all of the odd numbers from 1 to 100. What do I put here? So let's uh, let's not print it. Let's just create a list that has it. Let's put B for the value. So that means that we're going to have every value will just be the value itself. We're actually not going to apply any function to it. For the value B in So there's a couple different ways to do this. You can say range 1, 100, like so. How do I make it now only odd numbers? If b mod 2 equals equals 1. What would be another way to do this? Instead of this part here, I could say range 1, 100, 2. That's if you knew how the range function works and you allowed you to do multiple ranges. Sorry? So this is increment by 2 instead of increment by 1. That's an example of a of uh, the odd numbers. <clears throat> um, can you write a list comprehension that produces all of the composite numbers of composites up to 50? So what is a composite number? A composite number is a number that is uh, the, the multiplication of two um, numbers itself. So for example, 2 times 2 is 4. 4 is a composite number. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 is a composite number. Essentially, I want you to make all non-prime numbers with prime factors less than 50. This one is a little bit different. I'm going to start with the for loop. <coughs> we're actually going to have two for loops because we're going to have two parts. We're going to have the two composite numbers. I'm going to call this C1 or composite or composite part one. In we're going to say range. Let's start at two instead of one. Fifty. I'm also going to say four. Composite number two, composite part two, in range from two to fifty. Um, I'm not putting the one in there because uh, that's one times something that doesn't really help. And then here, what we're going to do is we're going to say C1 times C2. This C1 is going to range up over every number from 2 to 50. For each one of these C1s, C2 is going to range from 2 to 50. And so this will produce all composite numbers of, com of, number of the composites less than 50. 
So this is all non, these are all the non-prime numbers. Once we have this, we can say P or P in range of 2 to 50 times 50. If P um, not in, in, we call this not primes. That's all prime numbers up to 50 times 50. Questions about these guys? So the first instruction, the first less comprehension, produces all of the non-primes, all of the composite numbers. After we produced all of the composite numbers, we reproduce all of those numbers again. And what we do is we filter out all of them that are inside of the, the primes list. We only take the P primes that are not in the not primes. That gives us all the prime numbers. These are simple ways to do complex problems. Um, if we're able to do this, in, since these are actually technically independent of each other, we can do both of these um, in parallel, each one of those. And that would give us a parallel way, a parallel way to find prime numbers. Um, practice some list comprehensions. There'll be some off there'll be an opportunity to on the practice. All right. Number three. Write a function that does the following for each of the languages specified. Write a function that finds the real valued average of its argument array of real valued elements. So you can, for A, you can either write it in C or C++, it doesn't really matter. For B, write it Lua, and for C, write it in Python. Does anyone have any questions about how to solve this problem? Everybody understands what I'm asking you to do? So for example, when I start the C pro the C file or the C solution. What's the return value of my function? Or the return type, not return value, return type. It's a float or a double, right? That's because it says real value there. Um, what is the input arguments to my C program, or my C function? An array of doubles, or an array of floats, and And the size of the array. Because C does not have a way to keep track of the size without it. Doing it in Lua, you don't need to pass in the size because there's a way to do the size of the array without it. Same thing is true of Python. Um, so give a, give a chance, figure out how to write those functions, it'll be good. <coughs> um, You might not do this because we didn't spend a lot of time on C++. I'm not going to ask the C++ question on this one. I'm only going to ask the Lua and the Python question. Uh, but write the object-oriented components necessary in each of the languages specified. So for this one, it won't be C++. I think you should probably do it on your own time, but that's separate. Um, such that you'll be able to do the following. Um, have the user create a cube objects, and each cube object should contain a real valued member variable that is set by value passed by the constructor 
cube object should also have a volume function that returns the real value volume of the cube. Um, cube objects have only a single real value member variable because cube objects are cubes and cubes are of the same width, height, and length. They're all the same. They're all rectangles. Um, so you should be able to know how to create object-oriented programming in Lua. That's the set meta table stuff that we did with the objects and the object tables and things. Um, in Python, um, we talked about how to do classes and object-oriented programming in Python as well. So those are the two parts for that. If you have any questions about Lua, you don't have to do the C++, but Lua and the Python. How many people could do this today? Probably not. There's probably something you guys have to memorize for the Lua portion of it, right? Maybe something to remember for the Python portion of it? Just be ready to do <coughs> some sort of object training for it. All right, so this is the last one. We're going to cover how to do this today. Um, we'll cover how to do, we'll cover the answers for the other ones and uh, the, the other practice tests on Tuesday. Um, this is the, uh, whether or not we can generate the strings. Um, giving the following rule sets. Um, so let's do a little bit of practice first, and then we'll take a look at the tech, we'll take a look at the question, and we'll do it again. This are context-free grammars. If we have a grammar, so for example, let's suppose we have a grammar S goes to the number, let's say, 1, 0, um, S. We also have the rule S goes to the value 1, like so. We have two different kinds of things here. We have terminating symbols and non-terminating symbols. Which one is the non-terminating symbol? S is the non-terminating symbol because S goes so is on the left-hand side. The terminating symbols are the one and the zero. And since the one is duplicated, that's okay. This is also one. You still have just that two. That you still have only the two non-terminating or the two terminating symbols. Sorry, with the one terminating. If this is our grammar rule, and we want to be able to know if we can generate the following sentence. We generate that sentence. Who says no? Why? Say that again? So there's no S after the one here, right? Why is that important? Because you're correct, but why? Huh? There's no way for us to get two ones in a row, right there. So if we take this, if we if we start with this, this the sentence s, and we apply the second rule there, that will result in the single symbol one, right? If we apply the first rule, we will end up with the one and the zero. And an S. But there's no way for me to get a 1 over there. That's the reason why it's important for that guy. So can I generate that sentence? The answer is no. Can I generate, generate that sentence? <laughs> the answer is no as well. The way we determine this is we do the same thing. We say, okay, well, let's, let's apply rule number two. And if we apply rule number two, we get that sentence. We just get the single one. And that is not a valid, that's not the sentence I'm looking for, so that's not good. So I apply the other rule, which means I'm going to get the one and the zero and the S. Now, how can I get a one-one? 
I can't. So this won't this won't generate. What about that sentence? The answer is yes, so we can see this. So I'm not asking you to generate the trees. I'm not going to ask you to generate the trees on the test. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you, can you generate those sentences? So in this case here, we want to be able to, to verify that we can. We can generate the tree, so it would look like this. Now this is what the tree would look like. We generated the tree for. We apply rule two, we apply rule two, or sorry, rule one, apply rule one, apply rule two. And does anyone have any questions about this process here? Okay, so let's take a look at the question. Given those two rules, can the following sentences be can the following strings or sentences be generated? So one can. Because we can repeatedly apply rule one to get all those ones and have the zero terminate there. So this would be true. Two as well is also true. Because we can do it right there. Three is false, because once we generate that zero, we cannot generate anything else afterwards. Right? Same thing is true for four, five, and six. They both have that zero termination. Let's look at B. Given the following rules, can we generate the sentences? So number, so A is the easiest one, and then B is going to be a little bit harder, and C is going to be a little bit harder than that. They're all the same strings, but now can we generate, which ones can we generate? <clears throat> So we have, we have some discussion. This one's a little bit harder, right? What's different between this one and the previous one? We have three rules. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> very, very good. What's the big difference? There's two, there's, there, besides the fact that we have three rules, there's another big difference. So after the E on rule two, or on rule two after the zero, you have the E. That means that you can continue the zeros. Can I terminate with a zero? The answer is no. And so I can see that I cannot terminate with a zero on this guy. That means that any guy that ends with a zero here is false. I cannot generate number one, right? Because if I tried to generate number one, I would get one, 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 zero, E. Now I have to get rid of that E somehow, so how do I get rid of the E? And I have to put that, because the only guy that terminates the E completely is the 1. So I cannot have a 0 on the end of my sentence. That, therefore, 1 does not fit. So I, 1 is false. Is 2 true or false? False. False. Is 3 true or false? False. False. Is 5 true or false? False. False, because there's a 0 on the end. Well, 4, I, I skipped 4. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Is 4 true or false? True. Excellent, very good. <laughs> Four is true because we can have a bunch of zeros and then we terminate with the one. Same thing is true for six. I can also generate six because I can terminate with the one. So this is one of those ones. Be careful. Um, be careful with what you get because your intuition isn't always right. Part C. This is the hardest one. Can the because we have both the ability to generate to the left and to the right. Can we generate? Which of these strings can we generate with those following rules? 
If you don't remember, EPS is the epsilon or the, the, the null. It, the, the nil, it disappears. And so the EPS, you can actually make an, uh, a letter, dis uh, an E disappear. If, for example, let's suppose we had, let's suppose we start with E, I apply rule one, so I get the one and the E. I then apply rule two, so I get the one, the E, and the zero. And now I have the E in the middle of the one and the zero, right? Now I apply rule three. When I apply rule three, that E disappears and I get the one zero, right? That is two. So I can generate the second one here, right? So which of these can I generate? Kind of crazy, huh? How, just just a little change. These guys get way harder. Like, this is the reason why compilers get really tough. Can I generate number one? Yes. yes. Does anyone not see how to generate number one? All right, I'll generate number one. So to generate number one, we start with E, right? We apply rule one, which gives us the one, and then the e. We apply rule one again, that gives us the one, one, e. We get that all the way off until we get the four ones and the e, right? After we get that, we can apply rule two, which gives us the four ones, the e on the left, and the zero on the right. Correct? Now I can apply the ellipsis, or the nil, to get rid of the e in the center. So that's why one is correct. Two is correct based upon the proof we did on, or the demonstration we did on the right and left over there. Three, can we do three? No. We, so the suggestion you guys are saying is no. Um, let's prove that we cannot do three, or prove that we can, one or the other. So let's try. So if we apply rule, which rule do you think we want to apply first? One. Yeah. All right. So if we apply rule one. From e, we go to one e. Right. Uh, which rule would we apply now? Two. Two. So let's let us let us be methodical about this. If I applied if I applied rule one again, I would get one one e. There's no way for me to get a zero between those two ones now, correct? And that means that I cannot do the one zero one zero because I have a one zero with a one zero between the two ones. All right. So I cannot apply rule one at the end of that. So I could apply rule 2, which would give me the E0. So that would give me 1 E0, right? Well, is there a way for me to get a 0 to the left of a 1? No. The answer is no. There is no way for me to get a 0 to the left of a 1, right? That's what the question is. Because if we look at the one and the zero here, that is these two guys there. And if I ignore those two, I only have the zero and one. And I have an E letter to fill in the middle there. There's no way for me to get the zero to the left of the one given those rules. Therefore, three is not possible. So three is false. What about four? False. Why is it false? I have a zero to the left of the one. There's, this, there's no way to get a zero to the left of a one with these rules, right? And so once you know that, once you found out, like, oh, I can't get a zero to the left of the one here when I solve three, I look at four, I go, oh, there's a zero to the left of the one, therefore I can't do that one. What about six? Oh, there's a zero to the left of a one, so I can't do that one. What about five? Yes. So we say five is possible. Which sequence of rule applications would you do to get five? One. You get one one, which give you the one e, followed by the one one e, followed by the one one e zero, right? Then we apply it again, we get one one e zero zero. If you're confused about what happened there in the middle, this zero moved there. 
this one is that one, this one is that one. This E became that E and that zero there. Right? <coughs> then we can apply the ellipsis rule, which gives us the one, one, zero, zero. We get five. Yes? Didn't we do like any order of the first two rules we did? Probably. We could probably do rule two twice, rule one twice, and then. Actually, it might be rule one, rule two, or rule one, rule two would also work as well. I think that's correct. Yeah. I haven't tried that. I just found the answer. That's the only way. <laughs> You're correct, though. Okay. How can we change this here such that uh, three, four, and five, uh, three, four, and six are also true? What's the smallest change? So you're saying put the E after the zero. So if we did those rules, what do we get all of them? So let's do that. Let's look at that. So rule one would be E becomes one E, two would become E becomes zero E. What you mean? Right? And three is E becomes the ellipsis. Does that generate all of the sentences? Sentence one, for sure. Sentence two, yeah. Sentence three, okay. Sentence four, okay. Sentence five, sentence, yeah. That will generate all of them. Um, as an example, so let's, let me generate, let me generate sentence two because it's the shortest one. If I start with E and I apply rule one, I would get one E. I apply rule two, I would get one zero E. Then I would apply rule three, which would drop the E, and I would just get one zero. That's the same trick that we'd be using for all of them. We would just build that sentence out. Um, be prepared. I would say probably you guys should figure out how to generate a couple of rules. Uh, simple simple rules like this, and some sentences and whether or not you can generate them. Yeah. Are you going to um, what you do with some more letters than just E? Like, you're going to have um, your E and it's possible that I will for the the, the C part. Do uh, you want to do an example like that? Sure. Let me let me let me generate an interesting rule set for. All right, let's try, let's start, um, let's start with number one. If I start with E, let's suppose I start with E, I can apply rule one, that's the only one I can apply. When I apply rule one, that gives me uh, one T. Now when I have one T, I can apply rule two, or I can apply rule three, but if I apply rule three, I get one, just one, and that's not one of the sentences. 
for number one. So I'm not going to apply rule three, so I apply rule two. That gives me one T zero E. Right? Is it possible for me to get another one in that spot there? It is. Yeah. It is possible for me to get a one to the left of the zero. Oh, yeah. Right? So, so let's watch. So if we take the t and we call t again, we get one t. Uh, hold on. <laughs> t o e o e. Right. Then I can apply the rule one, and I could get one t o one zero e. Right? But now the question is, is that one and that one next to each other? No. Even if I put the ellipsis here, that would give me the one zero one zero e, right? That give me one zero one zero e, but that doesn't give me one one next to each other. Is there any possible way for me to generate a one one next to each other? It does not appear to be so, particularly in the front. Um, so one is false. We've gotten to this point here where you have one zero one zero e. Does that make three true? It would be nice, except for I have the e. I still have to get rid of the e. The only way I can get rid of the e is by making it go to one t. Right? And so one zero one zero would become one zero one zero one t, and then I can make the t go away and get one zero one zero one. Does that mean I cannot generate one zero one zero? We can't generate one zero one zero this way. Let's try again though. So I start with e, I get one t, right? <coughs> I generate, I apply rule two that gives me one T O E. Correct? I apply rule three, I get one O E. Correct? I apply rule two. No, I'm sorry, I apply rule one. That gives me one O T O E. No, sorry, sorry. Let me think about that for a second. One T, right? One T, correct? This is the other way that I can start to get there. Now how do I get, I have to get a zero, so that means I'm gonna apply rule two, so that gives me one zero, one T O E, which means I can apply the ellipsis rule to the T, which gives me one zero, one zero E. And I'm back at that point again, and I know that I can't generate that from there. So now that means that I cannot do this. I cannot generate rule three, so rule three is false. We can add one and zero, but we can get one and zero. Say that again? You can't end in zero or have two ones in a row. So we cannot end in zero and we cannot have two ones in a row. That's what we've learned so far. So this is one of the things that you have to do. You have to <coughs> kind of cycle through all these guys. So five is false, three is false, two is false, one is false, because all those end in zeros. Right? Can we generate a one zero just by itself? No, because the E happens on the end. So we can't just generate the one zero by itself. Uh, can't have two ones in a row, so five is false and six is false. <laughs> but we can generate number four. That's about it. Right? Can we generate number four now is the question. How do we do that? So that's the question. We can start with either, E or T. If we start with E, can we generate four? No, because that puts a one on the left-hand side. But if we start with T, that's an interesting question. What if we start with T? T would generate T O E, right? We could then apply rule one, and we could get 
T zero one T. We apply the ellipsis rule to the last T, which would give us T zero one. Right? We can apply rule two again to the T zero there, which would give us T O E zero one. Right? Well, what happens now to E in the center there? So we convert it to a 1t and we get a 1 in the center there. <coughs> so we can't, looks like we can't generate rule 4 either. Shit. <laughs> so the answer would all, for all these cases would be false. false. <laughs> Play around with these, see how well you can do on those. Um, to generate some, make some sentences, figure out if you can generate one or not. What can you do? Relatively simple, no, no, no more difficult than that. Over there. Make sure you know all your programming paradigms. Talk about these. Um, which of the paradigms above here are most common, do you think? Imperative, which other ones? Structured, what else? Okay, so object-oriented programming is very common, that's true. What's more common than object-oriented, though? Procedural. procedural. Almost, I don't know of an object-oriented language that is not procedural. So I would say imperative structured procedural. Then if you wanted to include object-oriented, I would include object -oriented. Um, Which of these languages, did we, which of these paradigms do we not have a language for? Logical. If you want to do a logical language, you would do prologue would be the one answer. Suggest. Um, why do most programming languages support multiple paradigms? Or use multiple paradigms, I should say. To be useful, probably the best answer. Um, the, uh, a language without multiple paradigms is not particularly powerful in and of itself. Some languages focus on a single paradigm and they become interesting, but they're not, I, there isn't what I, they aren't what I would say is useful. Some people use them to do lots of, or non things that they aren't particularly designed for. For example, I know people who are implementing video games in Haskell. If you ask me, I think they're crazy and they're only doing it because they want to prove that they can. It's one of those things where it's like, hey guys, I'm gonna go build a, build a wall that's 40 feet high and 20 feet thick. Everyone's kind of like, why? They're like, because I want to prove that I can. Damn it. They're like, okay, good for you. Nobody really cares. Yeah. Wouldn't a Haskell based game be able to run really well on multi core computing systems? Great. <laughs> Draw something to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> So that's one of those problems, is you get these things like that. Yeah. Is there an OpenGL API for Haskell? Is there a what? OpenGL API for Haskell? No. Why would they do that thing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, people have implemented all kinds of stuff in all kinds of languages. And a lot of it is to prove that you can, not necessarily that it's useful. I'm not saying that it's dumb. I mean, it's very cool to do these kinds of things. It's just kind of, eh. Um, which paradigm here uh, gave, has really given birth to the concept of the, or the field of big data? Functional is the answer. Um, functional languages are the ones that have given birth to it. It's the concept of Hadoop. Um, there's the concept, and the, con the concept that you guys should really know or take from this is the concept of MapReduce. This is a functional concept. Um, MapReduce is cons composed of two parts, two functional concepts. Map means apply function to independent pieces of data. Sorry, it's called pieces. Data. 
Live functions, independent pieces of data. Yeah, I don't know how to spell pieces. How do you spell pieces? I don't know. P-I-E-C. See, that looks like Pisces. Yeah. <laughs> is that Pisces? Did you, did you no, that's Pisces. Right? Right? <laughs> <That's like, laughs> I, I, my brain, it, it's not, I don't know what that is. Reduce is the concept of to filter or eliminate pieces of data. From the set. What does this sound like? Less comprehension, yeah. but what does it sound like? Let's suppose that you didn't know programming. What do people do every day of their life that this sounds like? So, <laughs> we still haven't figured out how to do that well. <laughs> Search, Google, right? I want to be able to filter the internet for my search query. I want to be able to do that by applying my search query to every piece of data on the internet. That's the concept of MapReduce. So when you go in there and you type in Java, object-oriented programming, how do I, or how do I split in Python? When you, when you type that into Google, how do I split in Python? How the fuck does Google figure that out? Like, literally, it's literally into the entire internet. It applies that string, how do I split things in Python? And it must apply that to every piece of data on the internet because I could just as easily search for, show me pictures of my aunt's dog on Facebook or and be logged into Facebook and Google would say, here you go, here's your aunt's dog. And you're like, fuck, dude. How do you know the difference between those things? It, it's instantaneous or apparently instantaneous. This is the concept of MapReduce. I want to be able to apply this concept of filtering everything, filtering to every piece of data on the internet. I want to be able to do this in less than a hundredth of a second. How do I do that? And the answer is, I have a server farm that has hundreds of thousands of computers in it with petabytes of RAM inside of them. And I ask each of them to do the filter and the sort and the, the cleanup independent of each other. So of those 100,000 computers, I say, how do I split in Python? Three of the computers will respond. The, other, the rest of the computers, the rest of the 100,000 computers don't do anything. Three of them respond with, here's 10,000 pieces of information that I know about. Then it sorts them in some way and displays them on your screen. That's how we do it. It's just that we ask all of the computers to do something, some of them respond, most of them don't. And we, the ones that don't respond, we say don't have any of that information. Each computer is responsible for a very small chunk of the, uh, of the internet. Um, functional programming. Functional languages have no, what? No, no mutable variables. Functional languages have no, what? Answer this at the very beginning of the class. When we're looking at the multiple choice. Two words. First one is four letters long. long starts with an S. Nope. Side effects. You just went back and looked at the answers. So functional languages have no mutable variables, and functional languages have no side effects. Because functional languages have no mutable variables and have no side effects, they are. Each function call is independent of each other. Functional languages can pass functions to other functions as data or parameters. Those are both correct. Answers. 
functional agents pass functions to other functions as data or parameters. This is called, what is this known as? First order or first class functions. Um, C by default is not a first order or first class language. C++ learned how to be in C++ alone. Here's some other questions. Um, go ahead and see if you can answer those. These are the extra credit questions that I gave. Why do we use context-free grammar? And which mechanisms provide provide object oriented programming? Um, I'll go through the complete answers for each of these on Tuesday. I'll also go through the complete answers for each of these on Tuesday as well. How do we do all these things? Um, and then we should be ready for the final. These are both final. Huh? Oh, sorry, so you're, are you going to post that with solutions? I'll post the solutions on Tuesday after the